Hi, everybody. We're going to wait about one more minute before we begin to let everybody get into the Zoom here and get ready for an introduction to Sarah. So we'll wait just one more minute, but if that's what you're here for, you're in the right place. All right, welcome to part two of the NC Sarah and WCET SAN two part summer webinar series all about state authorization. Um, this is part two, which is focused on an introduction to Sarah. Last week, our colleagues Cheryl Dowd and Catherine Kerensky, the Director of Digital Learning Policy and Compliance with WCET SAN, joined um, all of us to focus on state and federal building blocks for out-of-state activity compliance. And that uh, webinar is re was recorded and is posted on both the WTEC, WCET SAN and NC SARA websites for access. So if you missed part one, um, you can uh, certainly watch that recording at a later time. Catherine, thank you for joining us today. Yes, thank you, Mel. Thank you for having us. I just wanted to say quickly before moving on, on behalf of SAN, how much we really appreciate this collaboration with our colleagues at NC Sarah. So I'm really happy to be here um, and take it away, Mel. Looking forward to the presentation. Thank you. And we appreciate the collaboration very much as well. And it's um, been a, a great opportunity to uh, reach out to all of our constituents, our shared constituents, and, and help kind of lay the groundwork, some uh, introductory information about state authorization and today about SARA, State Authorization Reciprocity Agreements. Um, I am joined today by Marianne Boki, Acting President and CEO of NC SARA and the Vice President of Research and State Partnerships, as well as Jeannie Yaki Fine, General Counsel and Vice President, Policy and Regulatory Affairs. And we also have our colleague, Mary, Ag Mary Larson from NC SARA, who will be running the Q&A for us. And we do have plenty of opportunity and time throughout the webinar to stop and take um, some questions from all of you. So make sure you post those as they come up in the Q&A and Mary will help us manage that. Next slide, please, Marianne. So our agenda today, we're gonna talk a little bit about before and after Sarah. What was the problem that Sarah has solved? How does Sarah work? Um, what are some of the basics that folks need to know to understand how Sarah functions in the higher ed environment? And then we'll take some questions. Then we'll go into a, se a section called Sarah Today and what might be at risk, and we'll take some questions. And then NC Sarah resources, and we're, we will share all of those um, resources that NC Sarah has been developing and are publicly available on our website. With that, let's start with before and after Sarah, and I'll turn it over to Jeannie. All right, thank you, Mel. It's good to have everyone here. Let's talk about how it used to be and where we are now. Those of us who've been in the state authorization world a long time know that things were sometimes tough, uh, not only for the states, but for the institutions, I would say, especially prior to Sarah and for those who still have to operate outside Sarah. I can remember working with a client institution <laughs> that called me and said, oh my gosh, we have applications ready for two of our states. One, and they literally took pictures and had a yardstick out. One application is 18 inches high and the other one is over two feet high. And what can you do to fix this? And I told them that despite my magical powers, I was not able to convince either of those two states that they needed to submit less paperwork, but that I'd be happy to help them uh, review that paperwork before it went in. And that's kind of how it used to be. Some states wanted a lot of information. All states wanted some information. However, the caveat to that was some states in fact, quite a few states prior to Sarah did not regulate purely online education. 
So if you created a physical presence in their state in some sort, then they might choose to regulate you. So institutions were tasked with, well, if we have faculty members in the state, what does it mean? If we are setting up uh, just placements in the state, what does that mean? What do I need to do? And of course that varied by state. So some institutions chose to only send students to their neighboring states because it was much easier to determine what was required in their bordering states than to determine what was required in 49 other states. Larger institutions with very, very large budgets sometimes would get authorization where it was required in all the other states, but that uh, was not the norm prior to Sarah. So Sarah has helped with reducing that need to determine, at least for state authorization purposes, what is required in all of the other states that are SARA member states. It also has, of course, saved money uh, because there aren't uh, the myriad of fees associated with that, as well as the myriad of internal compliance costs. Uh, that staff can be used for other areas uh, with the, within the institution. Of course, right now, something such as professional licensure or other areas where staffing can be used. Next slide, please. So this is a, a chart that we did. Actually, it's been a couple of years ago now, I believe. Just to break it down, uh, especially for those not as familiar with Sarah or those who weren't involved with Sarah, uh, weren't involved with state authorization prior to Sarah. So I'll listen on a couple of them. I've already talked about the affordability, and when you have more money uh, available, then that creates access. When an institution has to not offer certain programs in certain states because of author associated authorization or associated costs, then what does that mean for the student? That means reduced access to programs that they may have chosen. Another area is enhanced protection. So not only do we have the authorization of the home state, we also have the policies required by Sarah, but also almost one third of states outside of Sarah don't require accreditation for degree granting programs. So that's another area where Sarah has helped lift the bar is with the requirement of accreditation. Next slide, please. I'm going to hand it to Melanie now to talk about how Sarah works. Thank you, Jeannie. So in this section, I'll do a high level overview of um, kind of what's some, what's some important information about how does Sarah work? So if you'd go to the next slide, please. Let's start with some essential principles. It's important to note that Sarah is voluntary. Um, all of the states that are members are voluntarily members and institutions that apply to participate and are um, eventually approved are, have that voluntary um, opportunity as well. So there's nothing forcing this on anybody, but all of those benefits that Jeannie outlined certainly apply. The other principle about Sarah that's really important to know is that it truly is built around acknowledging the traditional rules within higher education's accountability triad. That is the state's purview over consumer protections, accreditation over continuous improvement and quality assurance, and, and of course, the federal government. And it lays out this framework for reciprocity. Um, it's a SARA policy across all of the state members with the members being very important constituents in that policy. And NC SARA, the National Council, uh, works in partnership with the four regional compacts for that um, support and implementation of SARA across all of the member states. So these are just some essential principles about the design of the reciprocity agreements. Next slide, please. As mentioned, the role of the states is really important in SARA. States approve their home state institutions to participate, and SARA relies on the importance of this home state authorization as a starting place. You may have heard the word SPE or state portal entity. 
This is the agency in each SARA member state that's responsible for um, approving and um, assuring compliance with SARA policies for those institutions that participate. And NC SARA uh, maintains a, a directory of state portal entities on our website. Uh, NC SARA also maintains a directory of all the institutions that participate in SARA as well. Um, but, the, but the states are really at the center of SARA um, and ultimately are essential toward um, that home, the authorization for institutions within their state. Next slide, please. So how does an institution participate? What's involved? Well, this kind of outlines the steps for the application and renewal process. And it is a cyclical process. So in step one, the institution applies to the state um, SARA portal entity to participate in SARA, or if they're already participating an annual uh, renewal application. The state portal entity in step two reviews and approves or denies that. Step three, the administrative process begins with a payment link, and that includes step four, and then there's confirmation in step five. And then step six, the institution must renew annually to that SARA state portal entity to maintain participation status. And on the NC SARA website, we have um, information that goes into detail about the requirements for the application. And we'll be talking about that a little bit later when we talk about all of the resources that NC SARA has available for institutions that are interested in applying. There are many benefits to SARA participation for institutions. If you'd go to the next slide, please. And Jeannie touched on some of these already. Um, we've already talked about kind of reducing the paper burden and the bureaucracy associated with multiple authorizations for multiple states, as well as the cost, um, the cost for institutions. And um, in partnership with NCHEMS, uh, NC SARA released a cost savings study. And on our website, we have a calculator that estimates the um, potential cost savings an institution is um, either uh, has as a result of participating in SARA or could predict based on enrollment and a variety of other factors based on this research. Um, and of course, Jeannie talked about access to students in other states and opportunities to um, serve students beyond one state's um, borders with distance education. And another benefit that we just released this year, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later, is the SARA source. And this is a searchable online um, catalog of distance education programs that are offered by SARA participating institutions. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that later, but there's a lot of benefits for institutions to participate in SARA. Students also benefit. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so, it expands access to educational offerings for students. There's better resolution of complaints for, from students in SARA states, um, and we have a complaint process in place. And again, <clears throat> we're hopeful that the institutional costs that are reduced from participating in SARA ultimately go in one way or another um, toward students. And um, uh, so these are just some of the benefits. And, and we have a lot more information, again, on the NC SARA website about uh, aimed at students so they can glean information about what does it mean to be associated with a SARA participating institution um, and what are some of the benefits for me as a student. Um, with this, it's an important transition to understand that the primary kind of central purpose here is student consumer protections and what SARA affords. So I'll turn it back to Jeannie to talk about that. Thanks, Mel. So you see here this really cool daisy graphic that is really a summary of some of the high points of the consumer protection that SARA, and it should say SARA, improves. Uh, I already mentioned the accreditation requirement. And again, I think a lot of people who don't live in our world realize, again, that one third of the institutions are not required to be accredited. Uh, I, should, I should say one third of the states don't require their institutions to be accredited. That doesn't mean that a lot of the institutions are not accredited, but it, but it is interesting to know that. And by requiring that, I do believe, and I think most people would agree, 
that it doesn't it does help ensure the quality of education and when you have quality education that helps protect the students. Sarah also ensures that there is financial stability. We know that if an institution has a federal financial responsibility score of 1.5 or above, that they can participate. But if they're in range, the state can choose to put them on provisional or not allow them into SARA. And of course, if they're below 1.0, then they will be removed from SARA. So there is some protection based on uh, financial responsibility. With that, uh, I will hit on one more thing. And one is that one requirement of SARA is that member states must provide some alternative if an institution cannot provide the programs or courses that were promised to the student. So every state must have something. Some states have more than one something, but every state must have at least one. And with that, we'd like to open it up for questions related to anything that we've talked about uh, regarding before or after Sarah before we move on to the next area. We'll wait just a little bit. Mary, I don't know that we have any questions so far, but maybe I'm wrong. No, I haven't seen any yet. Um, I think uh, one of them is, we do have one that just popped in. Do institutions join local compact, their uh, regional education compact, or NC Sarah directly? So the institution must first, of course, be in a member state. And then they must have home authorization in that state. They'll join from their state. The state, of course, must be a uh, member of the regional compact or must be affiliated. So they don't have to be a member of the compact, but they at least must uh, affiliate with that compact and pay a related fee for that affiliation. So, those, so there are several steps. Uh, the home state authorization, the state that is in SARA, the state that either affiliates or is a member of the compact. So all of those things uh, come first. And of course, the, the institution must be degree granting and accredited and meet all the other myriad of policy requirements in the SARA policy manual. And then, perhaps then, they will be a SARA participating institution. And then once that happens, they'll renew annually. And the SPI will make sure that all of those things uh, look good again for the next year. And uh, then we'll see them again. And uh, what, what, one other question, Bob. just a confirmation, Jeannie, that it's institution to state to region to NC Sarah. And then Terrence has a question asking you if you can expound on what you mean that a state must provide an alternative if the institution is unable to fulfill certain criteria, if he heard you correctly. So um, the, state, it, the state is ensuring that the institution provides it. So the state has something in their requirements that say, okay, institution, we want to make sure that you provide, uh, you know, uh, that you have a surety bond or that you have a student tuition recovery fund or teach out agreements or teach out plan some level the state has that requirement and then the institution of course has to meet that requirement so that's what i mean by the state having it and then that impacts the institution having it and that's a sara state member requirements there's something uh to fall back on and terrence says thank you you've, you've clarified that for him Great. thanks terrence <laughs> and any other questions mary no, I think we can move on to the next session and I'll keep my eyes open. We will we will have plenty of time for questions after this next session section of this webinar and at the end. So with this, I'll turn it over to Marianne to talk about Sarah today. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you, Jeannie. So uh, I'm going to talk about or a little bit about uh, the membership that we have currently and Sarah, the Sarah participating institutions, and I'll even talk a little bit about data. So we'll start with our Sarah member states. I love this map because I think it is just such a nice visual. It really shows our Sarah partners here, uh, particularly our regional compacts. 
you can see it's color coded. So the dark blue is witchy, the orange is Mac, the cranberry is SREB, and the kind of soft blue is uh, a Nebi. So those are the four regional compacts. You can also see that there are some states that are grayed out. Those are the ones that have affiliated uh, with one of those four compacts, just as Jeannie said, so that they could uh, participate or be members of SARA. You also see uh, a big um, state that's black. <laughs> that is California, and California is not in SARA yet. The other 49 states are in SARA. We also have three territories and districts. We have Puerto Rico, U.S. Virgin Islands, and the District of Columbia. So 52 total, uh, but we do not have California yet. And I know people like to ask questions about California. And so if those come up at the end, we're welcome to talk about kind of what strategies in the, are happening um, in that state. Uh, I also want to just point out again that uh, the states are such a vital part of what we do. They are the boots on the ground. They're the ones who are doing the, the good work of um, explaining what Sarah is, helping institutions get through the application process. They're the ones that... Um, uh, review them annually. So I just think this map is really nice to kind of show the regional compacts and show all the states. This next slide, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what's on this slide, and then I'm going to give you a little bit more information as well, because this slide is all about the institutions that participate in SARA, and currently we have over 2,300 of them. Uh, the most uh, kind of big takeaway from this is that public institutions continue to comprise the majority of um, our institutions. Here it's talking about the distance education enrollments. I'll talk about that in a minute. But honestly, the, um, the majority of SARA participating institutions are public. It's about 50%. There's about 43% that are the nonprofits and about 7% that are the uh, um, for-profits. And you can also see here that we're talking about the enrollments because that's kind of really important too. Folks think it's interesting to know about the sectors of the institutions, but it's also really exciting to kind of understand who our students are and where they're being uh, enrolled. And we put both of these up here, the 2020 enrollment and the 2019 enrollment. We did that because 2020 was a little bit strange because of the COVID, um, but you can still see here that the majority of students are coming from the public sector and then uh, nonprofit and then for-profit. So it mirrors the actual number of this, that we have in the sectors as well. And that's sort of interesting. Um, I also wanted to mention that we've had a steady growth at Sarah, uh, about 5% a year in terms of institutions that are still joining Sarah. So that's been pretty consistent year over year. I also wanted to just mention a few things that aren't on here. Uh, and that is that 65% of the total HBCUs in the US participate in SARA now. Uh, also 620 community colleges participate in SARA. That represents 94% of all community college distance education enrollment. So that's a big chunk. I also wanted to mention that 75% of eligible US post-secondary institutions that offer distance education are now participating in SARA. So we've come a long way in, in you know, eight years. I also thought I might give you just a quick sneak peek of the data that's gonna come out this fall. We just finished our data reporting that we do annually. It closed uh, in June. And so we're working busily behind the scenes to crunch the data, but I just wanted to share a little bit with you. So for the exclusively distance education enrollment, we had a total of 4.2 million this year. And that breaks out to about 1.6 million uh, for out of state enrollments and about 2.5 million for in state. So, obviously, down a little bit from last year, but that makes sense given that uh, the COVID problem was happening, um, but still up from 2019. So, we're still doing a, a nice incline. Enrollments by sectors stayed consistent with what you see here. Uh, it was about 62% public. 25% nonprofits and 13 for profits in terms of the enrollment. And we can uh, ask more questions and talk a little bit more about data if you want to, or if you want to talk about kind of the nuances of uh, the institutions that participate in SARA. Happy to do that. I wanted to spend just a tiny bit of time talking about out of state learning placements because this is a piece that sometimes gets um, 
uh, forgotten or overlooked a little bit when we're talking about Sarah's membership. This is really something that's fantastic that's part of Sarah. Uh, Out-of-state learning placements are on-site learning placements that occur in a state other than the home state of the institution. They include activities such as clinical rotation, student teaching, internships, clinicals, those sort of things. Um, what we have found is that the bulk of them tend to happen, at least for our serotonin institutions, in the health professions, and then in education, and then in business, and then in a variety of fields. You can kind of see that at the bottom of that slide. But what's really important is that these out-of-state learning placements are covered by Sarah. That is part of being in Sarah. Uh, the 261,000 that were reported, that actually is from, I believe, 2020. It was down a little bit from 2019. But actually, this year, another sneak peek, it looks like it's going to be over 300,000 when we get the data all crunched and ready to share this fall. So we're going, we had a little dip because of the COVID pandemic, and then we're going back up. And in fact, a substantial um, increase from even 2019. So that is a real quick overview of uh, Sarah participating in states, Sarah, I'm sorry, Sarah member states, Sarah participating yeah. institutions, and a little bit of data thrown in for good measure. Uh, with that, I will flip to the next slide here and ask Jeannie to come back on. I believe she's going to talk a little bit about uh, the negotiated rulemaking that happened this last spring and Sarah. Jeannie. Okay. Thanks, Marianne. And if you could go to the next slide, we'll take a look at that. And many of you on the call, I'm sure, have followed us in some of our webinars and have looked at our call to action on the website. But I will give a refresher on that. And for those of you who are newer to this, then this might be newer to you. But the key component of what happened in NEGREG is, first of all, it was a big surprise. Because state authorization falls under a different section, uh, under 34 CFR 600.9, when it's state authorization related to distance education. And this negotiated rulemaking was in a different section. At 668.14, which is really about the program participation agreement. So it was a surprise to almost everyone that anything related to reciprocity came up in a PPA section, but it did. And we all needed to pay quick attention to what was happening there. And the key to the language that would potentially impact Sarah is that language that says in Romanet 3 here on the slide, it brings in that states could apply their education specific language. Right now, when the state becomes a member of SARA, they agree to not apply their education specific requirements related to state authorization on institutions that also participate in SARA outside their state. But this would allow states to choose to do that. That then creates a conflict, of course, with being a member state in SARA because you agree not to do that. So there, it becomes an inherent conflict between an agreement made up of states that is voluntary and a potential requirement at the federal level that would allow it. The key language then centered on what does this really mean? And what the negotiators said was, well, when you look at the last clause of this, it talks about the exception. So initially, some people thought, oh, good, there's an exception for Sarah. But the negotiators said, and those who uh, wrote about it that were negotiators said their intent was that exception is only for obtaining authorization. And that's why it's highlighted. And that highlighted was that highlight is there simply for the purpose of these slides. They did not highlight it. Uh, what does that mean? when they talked about it during the rulemaking, and I was one of those people who listened to all those sessions, live and after, um, obtaining authorization, their intent behind that was simply that. You would do your initial application, you would pay your fee, and the feds would not step into that. But after that, states would be free to add on whatever education requirements they chose and be okay at the federal level and be allowed to do so at the federal level. So what does that mean? That means that a state could then say, that's great, you're in SARA, I, we know that you uh, are a participating institution, but 
you will now need to meet our refund policy too, in addition to your own. So an institution could be having to meet multiple refund policies, or they, a state could say, we need an additional surety bond or additional strip. And when I say strip, that is a student tuition recovery fund payment. Now, the conflict, as I said, comes in where the, the federal language would allow one thing, but the SARA membership agreement would say the opposite. So right now there's also a conflict in the definition of a, a reciprocity agreement, which sits at 34 CFR 600.2. That definition is very clear that a state may apply its requirements, its consumer protection requirements generally. That means to all businesses, everyone is treated the same. There's nothing allowed by definition that could bring in those education specific requirements. So it would conflict with its own language at a different section. Eventually, if this language were to move forward as written, that would have to be clarified in the definition. So eventually they would have to align because you would have two competing uh, requirements and the definition wouldn't match the requirement at the federal level. So eventually that would need to be aligned. If that were the case and it's aligned with this language, then the problem would be if a state chose to add additional requirements, then legally, Sarah and NC Sarah, NC Sarah, the compacts, the state could not uh, stop that state from doing that. Because if that were the case, then the institutions impacted could have an issue with their Title IV funds. So right now it's been a, a circular situation on what could happen, what could come first. If states would actually even choose to, it's not saying states have to do this, it would allow states to do this. Who would do it? How would that look? So there's been a lot of, uh, there have been a lot of discussions. There have been meetings. There have been, uh, we've looked at a lot of data on what could be impacted. It, you know, we've, we've played out a lot of scenarios. But here's the situation now. Next slide, please. Right now, everything is paused. And what the federal, uh, what the feds released was a statement that said, right now they're looking at publishing something in spring of 2023 in April. If that is the case, then at least 30 days will be allowed for a comment period from the public. And everything, if everything moves along such that they can answer all the comments and move their language through and get it on the master calendar by November 1st of 2023, then whatever the language is that moves forward would go in effect July 1st of 2024. So right now we're almost two years away from whatever the language is going to be moving through. What we don't know is if the language will remain the same as what we have seen uh, already, or if during that time changes will take place. And of course, whatever we learn, we'll keep um, everyone informed. We'll have new information on our call to action on our website. But right now, there's nothing new to share, nothing new to tell. Right now, we're in a wait and hold, wait and see uh, pattern, quite frankly. We, but we do know the timeline, at least, as it sits now. Now, if something would happen and they didn't have whatever the new language is on the calendar by November 1st, 2023, and if, if it comes after that, then the earliest implementation would be another year later. So it would be July 1st, 2025. So everything will keep moving back depending on when they calendar it. Next slide, please. All right, before we move on to resources, does anyone have any questions on Negreg? I think there might be a data question too in there. Mary? I think there are, there are questions in, but it's not related to Negreg. Okay. Um, so would you like me to go ahead and ask those or do you wanna hold those to the next session? <clears throat> next section. Why don't you go ahead and ask them since, Okay. and then we'll, yeah. Okay, uh, the first one is, if a state is a is in a regional membership, i.e. Tennessee is an SREB, then it is assumed that the reciprocity among the states is in that region, or is it for 
the National Reciprocity Agreement. And okay, sure. So that part. Right. So the reciprocity, because um, the way Sarah is written, the reciprocity, whatever region you're in, gives you that reciprocity across the United States with any other member state. It's just that the regional compacts work with their states within that region to help oversee the institutions in those states. So we have the different compacts, as you saw earlier. And that reciprocity, however, does extend across the nation. So you're not limited to just that region. Thank you. And the other one is a broader question, somewhat related to how Marianne opened the, the webinar. Uh, what can you share about Pacific territories, Guam, American Samoa, and the Mariana Islands, and the sovereign states of Palau, Micronesia, and Marshall Islands? Any update if they will join, Sarah? And if not, would you know if they are regulated? And if no regulations, do the institutions still need to seek authorization? All right, so there are a lot of parts of that. Right now, we don't have an update on any of those as far as uh, for Sarah purposes. Uh, that doesn't mean there haven't been discussions with regional compacts, but right now we don't have anything to share on that. The next question is, do some of them have some type of authorization? Some of them might. So it's really important that your institution uh, try to contact uh, wherever you think you might have students or might be planning to have students that you contact uh, any of the territories where that might be the case. The third is, if you have been told they do not have regulations, meaning from someone from there, uh, if they are not overseeing state authorization, then there is nothing for you to do. You can then uh, provide distance education. And in, there, were, uh, there were some in the past that I know did not. They said, we're not trying to look at distance education. So that was the case, but I have not looked at those in a while because they're not part of Sarah. So uh, it's something I haven't had to do like I used to have to do. So I can't tell you, and I wouldn't want to be the one to tell you what the requirements are. So that is something uh, that please work with your general counsel, your compliance teams at your institution to determine what you need to do. But again, if a territory there, an agency in that territory that would be related to what would traditionally be some form of authorization tells you that you don't need to be authorized, then you don't need to be authorized. Other than that, uh, keep looking, uh, talk with your peer institutions to see if any of them have made determinations and how they determined it. And, uh, you know, sorry not to have better answers, but I can tell you that's kind of how it's been for a long time with some of the uh, smaller territories. And we do have one question regarding NEGREG. Can you give examples of the state regs that might be imposed should states be allowed to increase um, the regulation and what would be the negative implications? Sure. So I mentioned some of those. Um, and, and remember, too, that it's not even necessarily about increasing them because the home state already has a lot of regulations. The institution has already had to meet that home state authorization. But what could happen is you could be, let's say, um, you could be a Florida institution. So you already have your home state authorization. But the state of Maryland could say, we want you to follow our refund policy because we think ours is better. So if you have students in Maryland, you would have to meet theirs. But then Nebraska could say the same thing. We want you to meet our refund policy. Now, in addition to that, Kansas might say, we want you to have a surety bond. We know that you're already, you know, you already seem fine in Florida, but you have some students now in Kansas. So we want to add a surety bond on top of whatever you had to do in the state of Florida. And then Georgia might say, well, we noticed you have some faculty members here. And so we need to talk to you about that. You might need to do something um, with them. Uh, also, it could impact placements. Um, states might, could require something additional for placements. Right now, Sarah, as you know, covers placements under certain limitations, but that could happen. So it's a myriad of, of what coulds. And again, that doesn't mean that states would choose to do that, but it's what could happen. What does that mean ultimately? It, it means several things. One, if state A does that to state B, state B might decide to do that back to state A. 
So it becomes that. But also, ultimately, what does it mean? It means it could hinder access for students. Because it goes back to what I mentioned earlier, which is if an institution is concerned with trying to figure out what's changing in the various states, what new regulations they might need to meet, what additional things do we have to do, we need additional staffing. Uh, it's so difficult to keep up with these. We're worried that we'll be out of compliance. Sometimes they might have something in, let's say, the Office of General Counsel who will say, you know what, it's not worth the risk. Pull back from those states. Let's go back to where we used to be. We worked with our neighboring states. Let's keep it there. We know what we need to do there. And that's what we'll do. And what does that mean? You've just pulled back access to students from maybe 10 other states or 15 other states or 20 other states. So the impact goes back to, again, ultimately who's harmed, it's the students. As online education has expanded, we know that so has access. And students have been able to be in programs they may not have otherwise been. And so this could dial us back to you know, a little bit closer to where we used to be prior to Sarah. And again, limiting that access, limiting that access to placements. We're in a time now where you know, you don't have to read very far in uh, various articles to see that there's a struggle sometimes to get students in placements. So you think about having those impacted and how difficult it could be in, in a time where we're having nursing shortages, teacher shortages, it's, it would just be going the wrong direction. Oh, um, do you have time for a couple more questions or do you wanna move on and then come back? Why don't we do one more question that's relevant to this topic and then we can move on and we'll have time at the end. That sounds great. Thanks. And just, just a reminder that if for some reason we don't get to your questions, please forward it to info at nc-sarah.org and we'll be able to follow up with you at that time. Um, so one of the questions is, could you control this by having member institutions sign a revised agreement with Sarah to not impose specific regulations on members? or do you feel that you would lose some states? The question references member institutions, but I think it might be member states. Well, right now that is what states do. States do agree not to impose their additional requirements on institutions outside their state. Uh, so right now that's exactly how it looks. The problem will be uh, what when a state decides to go against that and follow federal language, again, you know, depending on how that federal language looks, what then happens? You know, that then places the regional compact in a situation where they have to look at that state and decide, are we going to remove you? And it, it creates a myriad then of potential issues because if the state is removed, then that means the institutions do not are not able to participate in SARA, therefore impacting access. So ideally, states would follow what they've been doing for the past eight years, those who started out in the beginning, because quite frankly, we've seen Sarah be extremely successful. So, uh, you know, that would be the ideal. We don't know what will happen. Uh, we will pivot and, and work toward whatever it is we need to do to make Sarah continue and to make Sarah work because it has worked for, at this point for millions of students. Uh, yeah. And we will have time at the end for more questions. Um, so I think at this point we will um, shift gears and talk about the resources that NC Sarah has pulled together to support the state members and the institutional participants, as well as some of those of you who may be thinking about institutional participation and wanting to know more before you really go down that road. Next slide, please. So the first, um, uh, resource that I will share with you is a page on our website called the Sarah Learning Station. And we have cultivated from our state members and many of our institutions very effective practices from the field. And we've um, kind of compiled them into different formats. On this website, we have a series of, N of Sarah Quick Start Guides. These are very brief, um, easy to access explanatory documents for institutions primarily that um, talk about SARA policy and help to kind of demystify what an institution needs to do and, um, and how a state might um, work with institutions around a particular SARA policy requirement. 
We also have two online courses now that are publicly available. One is Sarah 101. It's a, a, an expansion of this webinar, quite honestly, and goes into a lot more detail about the, the um, ways in which Sarah it was put together and the ways in which it works. And then we also um, just released with our In the Field conference, a online course called Foundations of Annual Data Reporting. And if you are a Sarah participating institution um, and you're responsible for the data reporting um, that occurs annually, you'll wanna make sure to take that course. It is a, um, a companion to the handbook. The handbook is kind of your how-to guide, but that course kind of lays out um, a foundational overview of data reporting. It also may be a helpful course for colleagues to take so that they understand the rationale for the data, what's reported. And another important part of that course is what can you do with the data dashboards? And I posted a link to those data dashboards earlier. How might they help you um, think about planning or think about your own institution in the context of the SARA universe? Um, we also have resources from NC SARA's institution conference. Uh, our first conference was last year, 2021, and all of the resources from that conference are available. And we will soon, uh, in about 10 days, have the resources from the 2022 conference all up on that website. And it's all accessible through the Sarah Learning Station. So it's kind of your one-stop shop. And I will put that link for you to grab in the chat as well. Um, you can bookmark it and take a look later. Next slide, please. I mentioned the Sarah Quick Start Guides. This is the topics that are covered in the, in the 10 that we have, and we're developing more. Again, we've developed these in partnership um, with our state portal entities and um, have really pulled together kind of some of the best effective practices. And these quick start guides really are intended to be kind of quick answers to things that an institution may have. So how does Sarah deal with field trips? How do I think about what a short course is in the Sarah universe? Um, what do I need to know about addressing Sarah on military bases? Um, one I would point out um, is the Institution Application Quick Start Guide, and that one is actually a much longer guide because it details and describes um, uh, information for submitting the institution application. With all of these resources that NC Sarah puts on the website, it will be very important to talk to your state's state portal entity specifically, as there may be some state-specific um, approaches or processes or requirements that you'll want to know about. So again, the, what we put on the NC SARA website is, is generally nationally applicable and you'll always want to be in contact and communication with your state's state portal entity. And again, the list of those folks is available on our website as well. Next slide, please. Um, also on our website, we have a variety of other resources that you may find useful in your day-to-day -day work. <clears throat> we have a collection of resources and a professional licensure directory. And as Jeannie mentioned, that's a hot topic right now. Uh, we have the state authorization guide, um, which um, provides information about state authorization requirements outside of SARA for all of the states and it's updated regularly. As I mentioned um, when Marianne was talking about the data, we have data dashboards and annual data reports and all of the data is publicly available um, on, the, on that page. We talked previously about SARA cost savings and the SARA cost savings uh, report as well as that cost savings estimation calendar, ca uh, calendar calculator are available on the NC SARA website. And again, we have a directory of institutions that are approved to participate in SARA. Um, and as Marianne mentioned, there's more than 2,300 of them. So that directory is growing <laughs> as we speak. I also do want to point out the SARA source. We're really excited about SARA source here. We launched this um, earlier this year, and it is an online uh, catalog designed for students to showcase SARA participating institutions distance education programs. And if you go to sarasource.org, and I'll put this in the chat as soon as I'm done talking, you can see this catalog and you can search it. We have more than a thousand programs in there now and it's growing. Um, and we're, we're just gradually getting more institutions and their programs in the catalog. And so we think that this will be an incredibly useful resource to students out there. 
as they look to understand what are the benefits of, of attending a SARA participating institution. So um, again, we have uh, a variety of resources available on the website from the SARA Learning Station through these other directories and guides. And we invite you to explore these under the resources tab um, on the NC SARA website. And as Mary mentioned, um, our email info at nc-sara.org nc is also a very important resource for you because sometimes you may not be able to find the answer to your question. And if you have put it in that email address, we'll get it to you directly. And that's kind of one of our kind of help desk uh, availabilities um, that NC Sarah offers. Next slide, please. With that, we are now toward the end. Um, and I'm going to put a couple of links in the chat uh, that I just mentioned. And Mary, we'll see if we have more questions. We do have a question. And that is, I think it probably goes back to Jeannie's portion of the presentation. What is the process to follow if an interpretation of NC SARA rules is different by a state and a particular university? So the university would definitely talk to their SPE uh, to figure out you know, what the misunderstanding is and what's happening. What then happens is the state talks with their regional compact and oftentimes they talk to us and we talk about you know, what may not be clear in it. We talk about the intent of the SARA policy language. And I can tell you that you know, the policy manual has been a work in progress since Sarah started. Um, it has grown. We have seen things come up that need to be addressed. And sometimes the language isn't clear. And when that happens, then an, an institution, a state, uh, can, will be able to, and, and has been in the past, bring that language forward uh, through their compacts. And then the compact brings it to the board and, and works with NC Sarah staff as well to help maybe bring something forward that can that can clarify that language. And with our new policy uh, process, then everyone will be able to submit language and explain the why and explain what might help it be better and run that through the system. And uh, we'll see changes in language that are brought about by all of this, the constituents. But that's the process. It's really a lot of talking, a lot of looking, a lot of uh, looking at intent. And also sometimes there's confusion between a may and a shall, something as simple as that, and that's all it takes. Okay, then we have two other questions um, on California. Can you, and they're both related to California. One of them is, can you talk about what's going on in California? And the second one is, could presenters provide an update on the status of California? That was, um, so it's super important that um, WICHE, the compact there that California's in, they have communications with California. So it's really important that if you have questions that you direct those to WICHE. And um, we have Molly Hall Martin, who's the regional compact director there now. Um, Demi Mikolau is the president there. She's also a member of our board. So I would suggest that you do that. You can talk with your regional compact. You can get you in touch with them if you're not familiar with who they are, and they'll help you with that. But they are in the best position to talk about what's happening with California. And I might just add on there that um, there definitely are still in conversations with California. Uh, those conversations continue, and I know what you is working very hard. Uh, with some of the uh, territories as well. As soon as we know anything about California or the territories, we would certainly share that because I know we're all kind of waiting to, to finish out that map. Um, but Jeannie's absolutely right. For the latest and greatest information, uh, the folks um, at Wichi that work in the Sarah shop would know the most about that. Uh, but I know it's working, they're working on it behind the scenes. I just so. posted the link to the Witchy Sarah page too. So whoever has those questions, you might just find the contact information there as well in the chat. Thanks, Mel. Um, and here's a question that I don't know if you're able to answer. Um, is it correct that California does not require additional authorization slash fees for out-of-state placement, out-of-state placements? 
that is something that you will, you can first look on our state authorization guide that's on our website. It gives you uh, California's requirements, but it's still important to use that just as a starting point and then confirm that information with California BPPE to ensure that nothing has changed, uh, whatever that is. Uh, they have had legislation recently and have made some changes. So please check with them to see what the requirements are. We also have the California Students Quick Start Guide, and that has um, uh, contact information as well. I'm I'm multitasking with the chat, and <laughs> so sorry for my delay. But that Quick Start Guide is a helpful resource around working with students. In, um, Thanks again, Mel, for yeah. putting all the various resources um, in because it's super helpful. And Mary, thank you so much. As always, for fielding questions, we are absolutely going to miss you for all kinds of reasons, but this is one of the reasons that we will also miss you because you do such a great job of fielding questions. It makes me sad talking about it, so I'm going to stop talking about it. Thank you. Um, I'll miss everybody, but I'm looking forward to sleeping a little bit later, taking longer walks and quilting and, and all those kinds of things. Uh, we do have one quick question, I think. The answer is to refer to the state authorization guide, but it's uh, should each should we contact each state department of education to understand out of state placements. And I'm not sure if that question is related to reporting of out of state placements, Marianne, or the policy of Sarah for placing out of state placements. So maybe Jeannie, you and Marianne yeah. tag team on that one. Sure, if you are a SARA participating institution, then SARA policy covers those placements as long as you don't have more than 10 students at one location per program at a time. So if you're exceeding that, you need to talk to your state portal entity to see if you can be allowed to go above that and also work with um, the states it would be the port state portal entity of that state. So they will communicate with the other state portal entity to have that discussion. And if it seems excessive, then you will need to work with that other state to determine what the requirements are for placement. Some states want to look at the, let's say it's a hospital, a clinical, they want to look at what that agreement is. And oftentimes, the board, the licensing board will too, which is independent of Sarah, but sometimes the state authorization agency will also want to see what that agreement is, how that looks. But again, that's if you have exceeded uh, what you're allowed under Sarah policy. And if you're not a Sarah participating institution, then obviously you need to be working with that state. And I would just add that if it is a question about data, um, we actually have a data handbook that kind of walks folks through uh, exactly why we're asking to report this data, what data you need to report, and how to do it. So that'd be a great resource to look at. There's just so many different complexities to it. Um, and I know we only have about three minutes left. So I, um, if you can't find it in that handbook, email me and, and I'll help you out. Thanks, Sarah. Any last questions, Mary? Uh, I, I think there's a there's one question I don't know if we're going to have time to get to, and so I will let um, I will remind the individual that they can they could send the question to info at ntsara.org, and uh, we can go. It's how is an individual academic program defined? So that may be for data purposes, and that would be in the handbook, um, but please feel free to contextualize your question so we know a little bit more about it. Um, info at nc saraorg With that, we'd like to say thank you to all of you who um, joined us today. And also thank you to um, Catherine and Cheryl at WCET SAN for this collaborative partnership that um, has put on these two webinars. Again, you can access the recording of last week's webinar and then soon the recording of this webinar um, from the Sarah Learning Station um, website on the NC Sarah site. 
as well as from WCET SANS website. And we're so appreciative of all of you who came and participated today. And we hope that we can um, continue to answer your questions at that info at email, and we'll see you next time. Thank you very much.